Hey folks, I apologize for the delay. Now, uh, before we start off with the session, just give me a quick confirmation if you guys can hear me and if you guys can see my screen. And if everything is proper, we'll get on with the session. Now, before we actually start off, I'd like to inform that we have a free learning platform called as Great Learning Academy where we have almost 100 courses with respect to data science, cloud, artificial intelligence, statistics, digital marketing, and a lot, lot more. And once you complete these courses on Great Learning Academy, you'll get a certificate which you can go ahead and add onto your LinkedIn page or onto your resume, which will be a huge value add for you folks. And you will find the link for that in the description. And also, if you want to learn through an app, we have the Great Learning app, which you can uh, find out the link in the chat again. And for those folks who are new to our channel, I'd uh, request you to hit the subscribe button and also click on the bell icon so that you guys get notifications of all of the new sessions which we schedule. And uh, also, it'll encourage us to come up with more such live sessions and upload high quality tutorials on a regular basis. So, uh, let's just, uh, you know, let's just have uh, a quick glance at the agenda. So, uh, we'll uh, quickly brush up all of the Python libraries required for uh, what we're going to do. So, we'll have a quick brush up with NumPy, Pandas, and Seaborn once that is done. So I've got certain data sets with me for uh, which are related to uh, this epic TV series and epic book called as Game of Thrones. And uh, we will be analyzing uh, some of the uh, information which is present in this Game of Thrones data set. And if you have any questions with respect to what we are doing, let's, uh, you know, you can go ahead and put it out in the chat. I'll take all of them up. So, uh, as I've said, we'll uh, start off by working on the libraries which are required. So, we'll start off with this library called as NumPy. And this NumPy library is the core library for numerical computation and scientific computation. And it also provides with a lot of uh, single dimensional and multi-dimensional arrays. And it forms the base of most of the data manipulation and data pre-processing tasks which we perform. So, as I've told you, there's a single dimensional array and there's a multi-dimensional array. So, if you want to create a single dimensional array, we'd have to start off by importing the NumPy library. So, here we'll have import NumPy as NP. So, here NP which you see is known as the alias. Now, once we import NumPy, we'd have to go ahead and create an array. And to create the array, we'll have np.array over here and we'll pass in a list of values. So this what you see uh, in the square braces, you have all of these elements. So whenever you pass in a list of elements inside of a sequence of elements inside the square braces, that basically accounts to a list. So we are creating this list over here and we are storing it in this object called as n1. Then we go ahead and print it out. And this is the result which you see. Similarly, if you want to create a multi-dimensional array, all we have to do is instead of passing a single list, we will pass list of lists. So here, as you see, we have the square braces over here. And inside the square braces, we've got two lists. The first list comprises of the values 10, 20, 30, and 40. The second list comprises of the values 40, 30, 20, and 10. And over here, you see that the first list comes in the first row. The second list comes in the second row. Let's go to Jupyter Notebook quickly and we'll go ahead and create these two NumPy arrays. So I would have to start off by loading this library called as NumPy. So I'll have import NumPy as NP. And once I do this, I just have to go ahead and create the single dimensional array. So I'll have np.array inside this. I'd have to pass in a list of elements. So let's say the list of elements are 5, 6, 7. 8, 9, and I'll also maybe have 0 over here. Then if I go ahead and print this out, as you guys see, I have successfully created this NumPy array. But this is a single dimensional NumPy array. So if I were to create a multi-dimensional NumPy array, all I'd have to do is, uh, I'll have to use the same np.array method over here. Inside this, I'll pass in a new list of values. And let's say I'll have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 
this is my first list over here then I'll have second list and in the second list I'll have 5 4 3 2 and 1 and I'll go ahead and store these two in a the outside list so I'll cut these two lists out I'll have them stored in another list so now we have a list of lists and if I go ahead and hit on run you would see that I have successfully created this multi-dimensional array now that was how to create a numpy array well uh, if we want to create a numpy array which is initialized with zeros for that purpose we have this method called as zeros so as you guys see I'm using this np.zeros method and inside it I am passing in the dimensions which are 1 comma 2 this would basically mean that my numpy array will have one row two columns and all of the values would be equal to 0 similarly if I would want to create a numpy array of dimension 5 comma 5 or 5 cross 5 so inside np.zeros again I'll pass in 5 comma 5 and as you see I have this uh, numpy array over here where uh, all of the values are zeros and the dimension is 5 cross 5 and now I'll just go ahead and create my two numpy arrays which will comprise of only zeros so I'll just add this comment over here numpy zeros and after this what I will do is I'll again create this new object called as n1 I'll have np dot zeros over here and since I have to give in the dimensions I will let's say have uh, let's say if I want a 4 cross 5 numpy array so I'll just have 4 comma 5 over here and when I hit on run you would see that I have successfully created this numpy array which comprises of these values now similarly let's say instead of 4 comma 5 I'd want to create a numpy array which comprises of maybe the dimension would be around uh, 6 comma 10 let's also go ahead and do that so here I'll have n2 and I'm also printing out n2 over here so the dimension of this is 4 comma 5 uh, so we actually wanted to create a 6 comma 3 matrix so I'll have 6 comma 3 over here and as you see we have 6 rows and 3 columns and all of the values are equal to 0 now that was how we could create a numpy array with 0 similarly let's say instead of 0 say if I don't want to fill my numpy array with some other number we can use the full method and this over here takes in two parameters so we'll have np.full the first parameter will give the dimensions so if I give in 2 comma 2 that would mean that my numpy array will have a dimension of 2 cross 2 and then I'll go ahead and give in the value which I'd want to fill this numpy array with and I'm giving this value of 10 and as you guys see I have created this 2 cross 2 numpy array which comprises of only this value 10 so I'll add another comment I'll have np full and after this let's say I have n3 over here and inside this I'll have np.full as I've told you guys this takes in two parameters the first parameter is a numpy array and um, first parameter is actually the number of dimensions so here let's say if I want maybe a 9 cross 9 dimensional numpy array and also the value which is present inside this is 9 so I'll give them the same value over here and I'll have to print n3 as well and as you see there are 9 rows, 9 columns and it is filled with this particular value now if uh, instead of the value 9 let's say if I want something else maybe if I want the value 1 over here I can just go ahead and replace that value and as you see we have successfully replaced the value from 9 to 1 so we have done this now uh, if you want to create a numpy array within a particular range that is also something which we can do so uh, before we do that let me just go ahead and check some of your questions so there's a question from uh, Landry Nulave and he's asking uh, uh, are we going to do EDA absolutely so we'll be performing EDA on top of the Game of Thrones data set so before we do that I just wanted to brush up on the basic required libraries which are NumPy, Pandas and Seaborn because these are the main libraries when it comes to EDA so we'll just brush 
up on these libraries quickly and then we'll head on to the main part where we'll be covering all of the EDA on top of the Game of Thrones data set. Meet absolutely, even though if you haven't watched the earlier sessions, you can definitely watch this particular session because we are covering the basics as well. I am teaching you the basics of NumPy array, the basics of Pandas, the basics of Seaborn. And then we'll see how to combine all of these techniques and do exploratory data analysis on top of the Game of Thrones data set. Darshan is asking what is feature engineering? So feature engineering is, so whenever you're working with a data set or a uh, just simply put, for now, just consider all of the rows or maybe all of your columns to be features. And when you're building a model, you have to understand that not all features are important or not all columns are important. So here you'd have to extract only those particular features which are relevant to your problem statement and which would give a better accuracy with respect to your model. So feature engineering, you can consider it. It helps us to get or extract only those features which uh, which would give us the best accuracy with respect to this problem statement. So anyone who's absolutely new to Python or anyone who's absolutely new to exploratory data analysis, they can definitely uh, stay tuned for this session and uh, you know, uh, rest assured that you will comprehensively learn about all of the libraries and you will also enjoy the EDA part with respect to the uh, Game of Thrones data set. Mohammed is asking, is Python difficult to learn? Not at all. So Python, when I actually compare Python with other languages such as Java, C or C++, I personally find Java to be extremely easy. So if you want to start off with learning a language, I'd recommend you guys to learn Python first because also uh, it's Python when you know Python in terms of job opportunity, it pays you more and also it is very diverse. If you know Python, you can do a lot of things. You can do uh, web scraping with it. You can build websites with it. And absolutely, Python is used for machine learning and artificial intelligence. So I'll take up the rest of the questions later on. Let me just uh, proceed back with what we're doing. So now uh, we wanted to create a NumPy array where all of the values come within a particular range. And for that purpose, we'll be using np.a range method. And as you guys see over here, np.a range inside this I'm passing in two values which are 10 and 20. So 10 would be the initial value, 20 would be the final value which basically means that I am creating a numpy array where the values start from 10 and go on till 19. I'm saying 19 over here because this value 20 is exclusive. So in Python normally the second value which you give is exclusive so that is why we have only the value starting from 10 and going on till 19. And we can have another parameter over here, which is the skip value. So if I want a sequence of numbers starting from 10 going on till 50, but I want the increment to be equal to plus 5. So we will be giving a skip value of 5. And as you see, so when I add 5 to 10, it becomes 15. 15 plus 5, it becomes 20. 20 plus 5, it becomes 25. 25 plus 5, it becomes 30. And that is how we progress through this particular range. And we have all the numbers starting from 10 going on till 45. Again, we don't. So even though the final value of here is 50, this list ends at 45. And that is because 50 is exclusive. So when you add 5 more to 45, the value will become 50 and 50 is exclusive. On the other hand, if you had given the value 51 over here, then we would have got 50 in this list as well. Let's head back over here and I'll show you uh, either the same two examples or we'll just go ahead and change the values in this np.a range. So I'll have np.a range np.a range and inside this I'd have to given the first value which would be let's say 20 and I'd have to given the second value which is let's say 50. Now if I just print this out like this you will see that we have all of the numbers starting from 20 going on till 49. 50 is not included because it is exclusive. But on the other hand let's say if I given the final value to be equal to 51 and now if I hit on run you would see that I have 50 included as well. Now we had seen that there was an extra parameter called as skip. So here I'll give in comma and let's say if I want the skip value to be equal to 10. 
Now when I hit on run, you would see that 20, out of that, we are skipping 10 more terms. So 20 plus 10 becomes 30, 30 plus 10 becomes 40, and 40 plus 10 becomes 50. We have 50 over here because the final value is 51, and that is why we have 50 to be included. So that was all about this library called as NumPy. Now we'll head on to our next important library, which is Pandas, which stands for Panel Data, and it is the core library for data manipulation. And as NumPy had provided arrays, similarly, Pandas provides us uh, different data structures, which are series and data frames. The single dimensional object is known as the series object, and the multi-dimensional object is known as the data frame. So um, this is about the basic idea behind Pandas. Now that we know this, let's go ahead and quickly create a series object. So to create the series object, we'd have to import this library called as pandas. So we'll have import pandas as pd and we'll have pd.series. So the series method is part of this pandas library. We'll have pd.series inside this. We'll pass in the list of values, which are 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And here keep in mind that the S is capital. So if you have a series with a small S, you will get an error. So make sure that the S is capital and we have the series object. Now, if you look at this, so this is a labeled array, which would mean that you have the corresponding indices over here. So this number one has the label zero. Number two has the label one. This number three has the label two and so on. And after that, if we go ahead and look at the type of this, so you would see that this is a series object. So, uh, Let's go ahead and work with pandas now. Now, what we are doing right now is I'll just have pandas. Now, once I do this, I'd have to import this library. So I'll have import pandas as pd. Let me quickly go ahead and uh, run this. And I'd have to create the series object so I'll have pd.series. Inside this, I will pass in the list of values, which will be from 1 to 5. And then I'll go ahead and store it in this object called as S1. So this library is still being loaded. So yeah, now it's done. Now I will go ahead and print this out. And you would see that I have this series object over here. And if I also look at the type of this inside type, I am passing an S1 and you would see that this is a series object. Let me go ahead and check some more questions. If you have any questions, keep, uh, keep them coming. I'll take all of your questions. Sahil is asking, is it advised to learn as many programming languages as possible? Uh, I'd actually recommend against it because uh, first you'd have to understand what is your problem statement or what, uh, what are you actually trying to solve or what field are you trying to get in. So let's say if you're trying to get into the data science field or the machine learning field, then your focus needs to be on languages such as Python and R. Now, uh, it's learning other languages such as C, C++ and Java. It won't hamper anything, but then again, instead of learning those languages, maybe you can go ahead and learn more of machine learning concepts, more of statistical concepts, you know, more of mathematical concepts. That will be a better idea. So you'd have to decide what is your final goal? What is it that you'd want to do? And depending on that, you will structure your learning. So Bankim, I've answered this question. So it would depend on what you're trying to achieve, what you're trying to solve. So if you want to get into data science, I'd only recommend you to learn Python and R and focus more on the machine learning side of things, more on the EDA side of things, more on the statistical side of things. Uh, 
again all of those folks who are new to python uh, be assured that you'll be learning all of the basic concepts of python over here as well so i just covered numpy library and now we are covering this pandas library and still if you want to know the other basics of python we have a lot of videos listed on our youtube channel you can go ahead and check them out so we have a comprehensive five hour course in python in hindi actually so that would be the perfect video for you guys to get started in python if you want to learn in hindi Sahil is asking, is there any other language that will take over Python like Python did with in Java? So the answer to that is Python took over Java because of the boom of data science and artificial intelligence. When Java was the top trending language, that was the IT boom. That was when a lot of people were becoming software engineers or software development engineers. But now a lot of people want to foray into the data science field. A lot of people want to foray into the artificial intelligence field. And since Python is very diverse with Python, you can do a lot of things. And most of the frameworks are also written in Python. So you have deep learning frameworks, Jazz, Keras, TensorFlow, PyTorch. All of these deep learning frameworks are based on top of Python. And that is why Python is seeing such an uptick now. Again, I'll take off the uh, take up the rest of the questions later on. Keep them posting. So I'll do this parallelly. So I'll be covering a bit of session. I'll be taking up your questions. So keep your questions coming. So we have created the series object over here. And now, as I've told you, this is a labeled array. So one advantage of a labeled array is you can actually go ahead and change these labels. So over here, the labels are from zero to four. But instead of zero to four, let's if I wanted these labels to be alphabetical in nature, then I'll add this new parameter called as index and I'll have a list of values and in those list of values. So I'll just have alphabet starting from A going till E and you would see that this label zero has been converted to A. Similarly, this value one has been converted to B. Similarly, this value two has been converted to C. So this is how we are changing the labels or the indices in the series object. So I'll have the same command over here and all I have to do is add in this new parameter called as index and I'll have a list of values passed in A, B, C, D and D and we are printing out the series object. You would see that initially we had all of the labels to be uh, to be in numbers, but we have successfully changed them to be A, B, C, D and E. Now, let's say by chance, if I give an extra label, so I have five numbers over here and five indices. What would happen if I given more number of labels? So I'll have F, I'll have G, I'll have H as well. And when I click on run, so you would see that length of passed values is 5, index implies 8. You'll basically go ahead and get an error. So you'd have to keep in mind that the number of indices values which are passing in and the number of values which are actually present are equal. So we have created that. Now we'll also see how to extract some individual elements from the series object. So we have all of these elements starting from 1 going on till 9. And if I would want to extract the third element or the element which is present in index number three. So the element which is present in index number three. So index starts from zero. So this will be zero, one, two, three. So this is actually the fourth element which is present at index number three. And that is how we are extracting it. So remember this in Python, the indexing starts from zero. Now, if I want all of the records, uh, all of the records starting from zero going on till the fourth element. Uh, here, what we'll do is, uh, I'll give in a colon, I'll give in four. So when I leave out this particular, uh, uh, you know, when I don't give anything on the left side of this colon, this would basically mean that I want all of the elements starting from zero going on till index number four. But then again, we know that index number four, it is exclusive. So we'll be extracting all of the elements till index number three. So index number zero, index number one, index number two and index number three. So this is how we are extracting the first four elements from the series object. 
then if I want to extract the last three elements from the series object, I'll have pd.series and I'll have these elements listed over here, 1 to 9. And here, instead of giving a positive index, I'll give it a negative index. So when I give minus 3, it would mean that I would want to extract elements from the back side and I'd want uh, to extract from the third last element. So this would be the third last element and I'd want all of the elements starting from third last to the last element. So when I don't give any value on the right side of this uh, column, it would mean from the third last element, I would want all of the elements till the last element. And that is why we have 7, 8 and 9 printed over here. Let me create a new series object. So now I'll have S1 is equal to PD dot series and over here I'll pass in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 and 9. And let me go ahead and print this out. This is the series object. And let's say if I want to extract this element. So the index for this will be 6. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6. I'll have S1 inside the parenthesis. I'll have 6. And when I hit on run, you would see that I have extracted this particular element. Similarly, let's say if I want to extract the first 5 elements. Then I need to have S1. I need all of the elements starting from index 0. So if I want the first 5, so it will be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. These are the first 5 elements. Sorry, these are the first 5 elements. So this will go on till index number 5. Let me give in 5 over here. And uh, as you see, I have extracted the first 5 elements. Now that we have done this, um, well, go ahead with the main part. Uh, so when it uh, all of our data structures, all of our data sets, which we'll be using in data science or in machine learning, they'll be in the form of a data frame. And a data frame is basically a pandas data structure. So uh, a data frame, you can correlate it. So if you work with SQL or if you work with Excel, you can correlate it with a simple table, which has rows and columns, which are present in it. And now, to create a data frame, we'll have PD dot data frame. Here D must be capital and F also must be capital. And we'll pass in these uh, these key value pairs over here. So in this key, I have name and I have a list of values which are Bob, Sam and Annie. Then we have the next key value pair which are marks and this is the list of values. So as you see, the keys have been uh, have been produced as the uh, column names. The values have been produced as the records over here. So let's actually go ahead and uh, create this data frame for ourselves. I'll add in a new comment over here, data frame. And once I do this, I'll have pd dot data frame and I'll have key value pairs. So I'll um, I have to give in a dictionary over here and I'll have the key which will be let's say just name and I'll give in a bunch of names over here. The first name is Julia. The second name is Annie and the third name will be Jennifer. And I'll give them their marks over here. So I'll have a new key. I'll call it as marks. And let's say Julia has scored 50 marks. Annie has scored 60 marks. And Jennifer has scored 70 marks. Now if I go ahead and click on run, you would see that we have successfully created this data frame. And we have these uh, simple methods over here, which will actually cover with uh, our Game of Thrones data set because it will be much more intuitive to understand these methods. And now we are also done with this Pandas library. And then we'll quickly go through another plot called as Seaborn, which is used for visualization. So here to work with Seaborn, it is important to keep in mind that this library is uh, based on another library called as Matplotlib. So we'd have to import these two libraries. So we'll start off by importing a Seaborn and we'll give the alias as SNS. Then we'll also import matplotlib 
and we'll need a sub module from matplotlib. We'll call that sub module as pyplot. And I am importing as uh, I am giving this an alias of plt. Then if I want to uh, load a data set, so there's a particular data set. The Sassy Bond library has a lot of data sets present in it. And from all of those data sets, I am loading this one particular data set called as fmri. And I am storing it in this new object called as fmri. And when I have, uh, when I print it out, so this head method basically gives us the first five records which are present in a data frame. And as you see, these are the different columns which are present. So we have subject, time point, event, region, and signal. Now, after this, what we'll do is if I want to create a line plot between the time point column and the signal column. So for that purpose, I have a method called as line plot inside this SNS library. So SNS dot line plot and I am mapping this time point column onto the X axis and the signal column onto the Y axis. And I'd have to give in the third parameter, which is uh, data. So this basically means that we are building this line plot on top of this fMRI object. Now let's understand this line plot over here. So if you see properly, you would know that from zero seconds to five seconds, the signal value is increasing steeply. But from five seconds to 10 seconds, your signal value is dropping steeply. So this is an interesting observation which you can find from this line plot. Now I'll go ahead and uh, work with the Seaborn library. So I'll just add a new comment called as visualization. And once this is done, I can uh, go ahead and import the li required libraries. So I'll have import Seaborn as SNS. Then I'll have from matplotlib import pyplot as plt let's wait till these uh, libraries are loaded after this uh, there's a particular data set called as fmri which is present in the seaborn library itself i'll just give in the name of the library which is fmri and I will store it in a new object called as fmri. Then I'll go ahead and have a glance at the first few records which are present. So if I have fmri.head, you would see that these are the different columns. Now let's directly go ahead and create this line plot. So I'll have sns.lineplot and onto the x-axis i am mapping the time point column and onto the y-axis i am mapping the signal column then i just have to give in the data frame so onto the data aesthetic i will be mapping the fmri object then i'll just have to show it out so to show the plot i'll have plt.show and when i hit on run you would see that we have successfully created this beautiful line plot so we are done with the brushing up of the required libraries. Now we'll head on to uh, the main part for which you guys were waiting so eagerly and we'll be analyzing this data set called as Game of Thrones. And uh, before we jump onto that, uh, I'll just quickly head on to some of the questions posted by you guys. So uh, some of you folks would want the source code for this. So uh, the source code for this will be, uh, so that'd be a link present over here in the chat. So you will get the source code from there. Sunita is asking me to make a tutorial on deep learning and project related to deep learning, sure. So we had uh, actually covered a live session on neural networks. So we'll do a similar session sometime on deep learning or project on deep learning. We'll keep that in mind. So maybe we can uh, do it next to week or next to next week. If you have any more session uh, suggestions with respect to uh, uh, you know what uh, you guys want us to take live sessions on, do put them out in the chat or any of our videos uh, because we genuinely want to provide more knowledge with respect to whatever you want to learn. So you can also let us know about that. So I see that most of you guys are asking for the source code, which you can find in the 
link so i believe someone from our team would be posting the link for the data set and the code okay um, so I'll take up the questions later on so we are already done with 40 minutes in this session and I don't want to waste any more time and directly head on to the Game of Thrones data frame so for all of those folks who haven't yet subscribed uh, I'd uh, urge you guys to uh, hit the subscribe button and also click on the bell icon because you'll be notified whenever we come up with new sessions and uh, also, uh, you know, it will uh, encourage us. So it will encourage our entire team to produce more such quality work on a regular basis. Now, let me quickly jump on to this. So we would require with these two libraries, which we have learned about. So we have learned about Pandas. We have learned about NumPy. Now I have quickly loaded these two libraries. Now I have this data frame called as battles. So this is a CSV file which comprises of different battles which have happened in the Game of Thrones series. So to load this file, I'll just write down pd.read underscore CSV. So this read underscore CSV method helps us to load a CSV file. So this is how I'm loading this file and I am storing it in this object called as battle. I have successfully stored it. Now, I'll have a glance at the first five records which are present in this battles data frame. So, we have our, uh, this is the first of uh, two data sets of the Game of Thrones. So, here in this data frame, we have all of these columns over here. So, this name which you see is the name of the battle. So, we have around uh, maybe 40 odd different battles which have occurred through the seven books. So you have Battle of the Golden Tooth, you have Battle of the Marmor's Ford, you have Battle of River Run, you have Battle of the Green Folk, and so on. This column tells us in which year the battle occurred in. So Game of Thrones was mostly based throughout the uh, 298, 299, and 300 AC EOS. Then you have the uh, this column which would tell you who is the attacker king. So here, uh, for this battle, uh, which is Battle of Golden Tooth, the attacker king was Joffrey and uh, Tom and Baratheon and the defender king was Rob Stark. So here attacker one basically tells you who is the primary attacker. So primary attackers are Lannisters over here. It, I mean, we already know that the Lannisters have started most of these wa wars. So this is not really, uh, you know, not really new information. Then we have this major death column. This major death column tells us if any major death has occurred in this war. So let's say if someone uh, such as uh, maybe Jamie Lannister has died or Rob Stark has died. So if there's any major death involved in this, uh, if in this battle, then we'll have the value 1. On the other hand, if there's no major death, then we'll have 0. Similarly, we have this major capture column. So if the value is 0, it would mean no major captures have occurred in this battle. Similarly, if we have the value 1, that would mean some major captures, some uh, you know, really powerful uh, has been captured. Then we have uh, attacker size over here. Attacker size would uh, tell you the number of people who have, uh, you know, who have uh, fought on the attacker side. Then you have who's the commander who was leading the army of the attacking side. Similarly, you have this column which would tell you who is the commander who is uh, leading the defender side. Then you have the different regions in which all of these battles occurred. So let's say if we take uh, this particular battle, which is Battle of the Golden Tooth. So this battle has occurred in Westerlands. So this is some basic information about our data frame. So before we do EDA, it's actually important to understand what is the data about. Now, if I want to know the number of rows and number of columns which are present in this data frame, I'll just have battle.shape. And you would see that we have this value 3825, which would basically mean there are 38 records present in this data frame and 25 columns present in this data frame. Now, 
some of these columns are uh, not very intuitive. So let's say I have attacker one over here. Now, instead of attacker one, I'd want this to be more intuitive. So I'd want to rename this column from attacker one to primary attacker. So for that purpose, I have this method called as rename. I'll use this rename method. I'm using this rename method on top of this battle object. And inside this, I have this uh, parameter called as columns, which would help me to rename this column. So for this columns, I'll pass in a dictionary. Key would be the column, which I'd want to rename. Value is to which particular value would I want to rename this column. So I am renaming this column attacker1 to primary attacker and when I set in place is equal to true this would mean that the change directly happens in the data frame itself now once I make that change I'll just go ahead and have a glance at the change data frame so you would see that initially the name of the column over here was attacker1 but after using this particular method we have changed the name of the column from attacker1 to primary attacker similarly we have the uh, we have the defender one column over here. Defender one means who is the primary defender. So here I'll use the same method, which is uh, battle dot rename. So rename is the method and I'm using this method on top of the battle object and I'll have this parameter columns and you would see that I'm passing in this key value pair. Key is this particular column a value as to which value I'd want to change this name to. So I am renaming defender one to primary defender and when I set in place is equal to true, the changes automatically are saved in this data frame. Then I'll have a glance at this modified data frame. So you would see that I have changed the name over here. So uh, this was some uh, you know basic pre-processing for this data frame. Now, if I want to know, uh, you know how many times a king has attacked, so I have this attacker king column. So let's say if I want to know the number of times Rob Stark has attacked someone, the number of times Joffrey and Tom and Baratheon have attacked someone, then I can use the value counts method, which would give me the frequency of a categorical column. So this is a categorical column, as you see. So all I'll do is I'll have battle and inside this, I'll give in the name of the column, which is attacker king. And when I use the value counts method on top of this column, this will give me the frequency of values. So here it would seem that Jeff Joffrey and Tom and Baratheon have attacked, uh, you know, have attacked uh, uh, 14 times. So it seems like, uh, you know, Joffrey and Tom are, uh, you know, are uh, mostly the starters of all of these wars which have happened in Game of Thrones. And over here when we see Stannis Baratheon, so Stannis Baratheon has only attacked uh, five times. Then similarly we have Rob Stark over here. So Rob Stark has started an attack 10 times. Then we have the Greyjoys. So the Greyjoys have started the attack seven times. So this is a simple information which you can find out about uh, Attacker King. And uh, if I want to know how many battles have occurred in different locations. So we have the location column. Now, uh, let's say if I want to know how many battles have occurred uh, at Golden Tooth, how many battles have occurred at River Run. Then I'll just use value counts again for this particular column. And you would uh, see that Winterfell and River Run have the most number of battles. So Winterfell, at Winterfell, three battles have occurred. Similarly, at River Run, three battles have occurred. But from over here to here, you would see that only one battle has occurred at these different locations. And uh, we have, let's say, we have Storms and over here, Storms and again has only two battles which have occurred. So uh, that was understanding about those categorical columns. Now that is done. What we'll uh, do is we'll uh, do some basic visualization to understand this uh, to understand this data frame better. So uh, to do visualization, we have uh, already uh, imported the Seaborn and Matplotlib earlier. So these are the two important libraries for visualization. I'll go ahead and load these two up. Now that these two are loaded. I'd want to understand, um, you know, how many, uh, so over here we had looked at the frequency of attacker king. 
so now i'd want to know uh, i'd want to know the bar. so here what i'm doing is let's say if a king has attacked then i'd want to know what is the size of his army so that is why i'll have attacker king mapped on to the x axis attacker size mapped on to the y axis and i am creating this bar plot on top of the battle data frame obviously so here this sns dot set i'm just setting the figure size over here because uh, there are a lot of things which are present in this visualization so here we have four attackers we have Joffrey and Tommen Baratheon then we've got Robb Stark then we've got the Greyjoys and then we've got Stannis Baratheon so here it seems that whenever Stannis Baratheon attacks he has a huge army size so if you look at Stannis Baratheon's army size to uh, the to other Baratheons or to even Robb Stark or to even Greyjoy so if we look at the so Stannis Baratheon he would have a size of around 30000 in general similarly if we look at grey joys grey joys are uh, you know uh, maybe <coughs> <coughs> sorry for that so uh, grey joys would have uh, their uh, the army uh, the size of their army would be somewhere maybe close to around 1000 or 2000 not more than that Similarly, uh, Joffrey and Tommen Baratheon, their army size would be around close to ten thousand. So this is an interesting observation. So uh, you know, it seems that Stannis Baratheon had a huge army along with him when compared to other attackers. Now, similarly, if I want to know the army size of the defender, so this time. what i'm doing is i am mapping the defender king on to the x axis and i am mapping the defender size on to the y axis now when i run this so these are all of the defenders so this time we see that whenever uh, so out of all of these kings whenever renly baratheon was attacked he had the maximum army size so maybe in some battle or uh, enly baratheon would have been attacked and in that particular battle he had an army size of 20000 then followed by uh, joffrey and tommen baratheon over here so it seems that whenever joffrey and tommen baratheon are attacked their army size is around uh, 8000 to 9000 then we've got stannis baratheon now compare this to over this over here so whenever stannis baratheon is attacking it seems that he'll have a larger army but on the contrary whenever it's stannis baratheon who is being attacked in that particular point it seems that he'll have a very small army so this is very interesting isn't it so uh, that was about uh, attacker attacker size and defenders and defender size And now, if I uh, want to know what are the different battle types that these uh, attackers have engaged in, so this time I'll be using this method called as count plot, and I am mapping the attacker king column onto the x-axis, and hue hue basically determines the color of these bars. So the color of these bars is being determined by the battle type. Now, when I hit on run. so you would see that uh, again we have the same attackers who are joffrey tommen baratheon drop stark so we've got the grey joys then we've got only stannis baratheon so it would seem that when it comes to joffrey and tommen baratheon they mostly engage in a pitched battle and uh, it's uh, you know they have uh, they have ambushed someone very few times right so uh, joffrey and tommen baratheon they have uh, um they have been in a pitched battle six times but they have only ambushed someone three times but when you talk about rob stark so it seems that rob stark mostly ambushes his enemies or ambushes uh, you know uh, against someone else so rob stark has ambushed the opponent five times and then you have the grey joys so it seems that it's only the grey joys who have engaged in this raising type of battle then you have <coughs> then you have stannis baratheon so uh, here if you look at this you have no orange color bar which would mean that stannis baratheon has never ambushed anyone so either stannis baratheon was part of a pitched battle or he was part of a siege battle so quite interesting observations over here 
now there is another data set so till now we were looking at the battles data set now we have another data set called as character deaths which would tell me about the different deaths which have occurred over here so i have this character at csv file i am storing it in this new object called as death and then i ha I'll have a glance at the first few records <clears throat> So these are the names of all of the characters who have died in the series. So and this is in alphabetical order over here. So you have uh, <coughs> you have Adam Marbrand who was uh, you know whose allegiance is Lannister. You've got Adric Humble who belongs to the Greyjoy clan. Then you have the Death Year over here. So Death Year obviously it has occurred up either in two, at the year two ninety eight, two ninety nine, or three hundred. Then you have the Book of Death. So in which Book has this character died. So when you have 3.0, this would mean that this character has died in the third book. When you have 5.0, this would mean that this character has died in the fifth book. Then you have the death cha uh, death chapter, which would mean so in the fifth book, Adric Humble has died in the twentieth chapter. Similarly, Egon Frey has died in the third book in the fifty-first chapter. So interesting observation again. Then you have the gender over here. So if the gender value is one, that would mean this uh, this guy is male, and if the gender value is zero, that would mean this uh, character is female. <clears throat> And then you have nobility, which would tell you if this uh, person is, uh, you know, is actually noble or not. Then you got, uh, then you basically have all of these names of different books over here. So this is the first book, this is the second book, and so on, which will tell you if this person has appeared in this particular book or not. So that is pretty much it about this. Now. What we'll do is we will look at the shape of this. So we have nine seventeen and thirteen, which would mean that there are nine hundred and seventeen records which are present in this data frame and thirteen columns present. So overall, we have nineteen hundred and seventeen deaths. Now, if I want to do a gender comparison with respect to the number of deaths over here, so I will just pass in this gender column. And I'll use the value counts method. And here you would see that out of these 970, 17 characters who have died, 760 of them are male characters. So 760 male characters have died, and it's only 157 female characters who have died. Similarly, if I want to know. How many uh, people who have died belong to nobility, and how many of them do not, uh, you know, do not belong to nobility? So this is sort of uh, even. <clears throat> so out of all the people who have died, 487 are not noble nobility, and 430 of them uh, do belong to nobility. Then similarly, what I'm going to do is so this was uh, with respect to the character uh, <coughs> categorical columns. Now, if I want to understand about the death year, if I that which basically means in which year, uh, how many number of deaths have occurred. I'll use a uh, count plot over here, and inside count plot, I am passing in the death year column. So uh, <clears throat> you have this uh, death year. This is the column which I'm passing over here, and when I hit on run, you would see that. So you have all of these years. So these books basically depict uh, the this particular decade or this particular uh, time zone from 297 AC to 300 AC. So it would seem that most number of deaths have occurred in the year hundred and uh, you know in the year two ninety nine. So you have uh, close to one sixty deaths. So that's huge, isn't it? So you have close to hundred and sixty deaths which have occurred in the year two ninety nine AC. Similarly, in the year three uh, hundred AC, you have around hundred deaths occurring. Then, in the year two ninety eight AC, you have around forty uh, two deaths occurring. So it seems that there was a lot of peace in year two ninety seven. There were maybe a lot of battles did not occur in that year, or maybe people were just more uh, you know more peaceful. So maybe you would have around uh, only five to six deaths occurring in this year. So interesting uh, plot again over here. So after this, now I uh, want to know out of these characters who have died, to which allegiance do these people belong to? Allegiance is basically to which clan have they, uh, you know, do they fight uh, fight from? 
So again for this I am using a count plot. Let me zoom this for you guys so that the text over here is clear. This is too much of zoom so let me reduce this a bit. So if we look at this, so this is none. So you basically, um, <clears throat> so basically these are people who have died, but the allegiance is not stated. So it would seem that most of the deaths belong to the Knight's Watch. So you have around uh, maybe 110 or 115 deaths from the Knight's Watch side. Then you have, uh, uh, then it seems to be, uh, uh, some allegiance over here who have around close to 100 deaths. Then you have the Greyjoys. So the Greyjoys seem to have around 50 deaths. Then we have the, uh, let's say, House of Stark. The House of Stark has around maybe 30 odd deaths over here. But if you compare the other houses, so let's say if you talk about House of Baratheon, seems like very few people have died from the House of Baratheon. And similarly, if you look at the House Tyrell or uh, maybe even uh, House Martel, very few deaths have occurred from their side. So all of this is, uh, you know, all of this is the exploratory data analysis, which I have uh, done with respect to the different columns which are present in this data frame. So this brings us to the end of this session. If you have any doubts, go ahead and put them up. So uh, I'll take a couple of questions more. So for folks who are asking for the data frame and the code file, you can get it on Great Learning Academy. You will find the link for it over here. Sunita is asking where can she find information about different methods so uh, if you uh, I mean we don't have the time to explain all of the uh, you know about all of the methods which I've used over here so uh, if you want to know more just give in the column name in Google just search for it and you will directly find it. Tamila India is asking what is the use of figure and fix size so figure and fix size would help us to reshape this so over here let's say I have given the size to be equal to 13 and 5 but instead of 13 and 5 if I keep it to be let's say 13 um, I'll actually make it 15 and 10 now when I hit on run you would see that the size of this image has changed so you can go ahead and change the figure size with this command over here. Uh, most of you guys had the same question with respect to figure dot fix size. So we have used uh, to uh, just change uh, the dimensions of the figure which we have plotted. Justin is asking us to do a similar soccer analysis using Python. Sure, we'll absolutely do that. So uh, <clears throat> we'll take up uh, a new soccer session. Maybe we'll have uh, um, FIFA analysis with Python. So that is something which we can definitely do. Okay, guys. So I'll take a leave from my side. Thank you very much for attending the session. And before I actually drop off, uh, if you uh, haven't yet checked out Great Learning Academy, please go ahead and do that. You will find the link in the chat. And also you can check out our app. So the link for the app will also be present. And if you haven't yet subscribed to our channel or hit on the bell icon, please do that as you'll be notified whenever we are coming up with more such new sessions. And it will also personally encourage us to provide you with more such high quality tutorials on a regular basis. Thank you very much, guys.